Good morning, everyone, and um, it's good to be back here in CTK for the Zoom of the Word. Um, can are my slides on screen? Okay. All right. Thank you. Again, hi. Uh, my name is Dresty, and um, I'd like to introduce our small family. Um, I'm a doctor and I'm married to Cecilia, who is a teacher. She's here, She's my backup dancer. So she can take over actually and give this talk. So uh, you all know my son. His name is Santino. He's almost 14. He's turning 14 <laughs> next, uh, next week. And some of you may have heard him sharing his reflections last year in our daily shots. We've been part of the Verbum Day family since 2016. And together with uh, some of you here, we are part of the School of Apostles in Pansol with our dear missionaries. And Cecilia and I uh, finished our one-year discernment course um, last November to become missionaries of the married couples branch of the Verbum Dei Fraternity. Uh, hello, Doc. Sorry, yes. you're sharing uh, your screen, all of your screen. I see, I see, I see. Uh -huh. <laughs> and the whole screen the whole screen yeah yeah, yeah. sorry there, there thank you there. maybe okay. the powerpoint you there yeah okay this one okay again air screen there you go better that's what that works. Okay. <laughs> All right. Sorry. Okay. So we are, uh, we just finished our one year discernment course. So now we're preparing for the um, formation course. Okay. Okay. So let's begin our guidelines and, and allow me to begin our guidelines for prayer with the ending of our gospel reading. Now, in a way, uh, this is the climax of the reading, so the juicy and dramatic part. And let, uh, let me read. When the people in the synagogue heard this, uh, they were all filled with fury. They rose up, drove Jesus out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town had been built to hurl him down headlong. But Jesus passed through the midst of them and went away. So after hearing Jesus' words, after their close encounter with Jesus, all the people, not just one or two, all were filled with fury. And they were not just disturbed or upset or mad. In my Bible, it says they were filled with rage. In fact, murderous rage, an anger that moved them to action to stand up, to drive Jesus out of the town with the clear intent to throw him over a cliff. How dramatic, what a scene. Have you ever felt that kind of fury, that kind of anger, that kind of rage? Maybe while driving. <laughs> Have you ever felt that degree of emotion that moves you? Emotion that makes you get up and do things? Maybe outrageous things. Sometimes in our close encounter with him, Jesus comes to bring this type of fire, this kind of uh, fiery emotion. In Luke 12, 49, Jesus says, I have come to bring fire to the earth and how I wish it were already kindled. When we encounter Jesus, when we encounter his word, Sometimes his purpose is to rile things up, to disturb and upset our thoughts, to stir up emotions. Tino and I and Cecilia, we have this recurring discussion about what makes a movie or a novel or a piece of art. We we're talking about art, the art of uh, Ruel earlier. <laughs> a piece of art or music, what makes a movie good? And we often take time to discuss the lyrics of a song Tino has discovered, or as he is reading a book, we keep tabs 
on his reactions, insights, and questions. And in this discussion, I always say that if the book or the movie stirs in you strong feelings, whether good or bad, happy feelings or sad feelings, then that is a good movie. That is a well-crafted, great work. Of course, that's just one criteria. For example, whenever we watch Hunger Games, no matter how many times we watch it, uh, Cecilia is so furious <laughs> at Pita. <laughs> start palang, start palang na movie. Galit, galit, na galit. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, another example is uh, uh, a week ago, Santina started reading Animal Farm you know, by George Orwell for a book report. He read it over three days and it, he was so engaged in it, he would uh, wait, read until the wee hours. You know? And every morning at breakfast, we talk about Animal Farm. And every day, <laughs> the events in that book made him feel worse <laughs> and worse you know, when Snowball got evicted. It's all it made him feel worse and worse each day. Another time, me, Tina made an artwork you know, last year. In it, there was a man on a cliff you know, with dark clouds looming. To me, it seemed like dark clouds. You know, and I was pondering over it a while. For me, it seemed the sad, that the man was so, so, so sad. And art can speak to each viewer in ways even unintended by the artist. Each viewer can have a totally different experience of the art. Each of us experiences prayer, our encounter with the word, with the presence of Jesus, in a totally different way. In your prayer, are you moved? And if or when you are moved, do you notice these feelings? Can you name them? Can you share or talk about your rage, your sadness, your joys with Jesus? I would like to quote these wise words from my spiritual director, a dear friend and someone very familiar to many of you from this book, <laughs> A Life of Fear. So we read, uh, care needs to be taken in prayer is always and only about getting down to business. Perhaps our prayer is neither strictly affective nor only effective. There's often some mixing, but an effective prayer can be very effective too. Not many romances blossom if when we go to meet the beloved, the only discussion is always and only right to business. What is effective prayer? It's a way of prayer which makes use of the emotions or feelings or the will as opposed to prayer of the intellect. An affective prayer springs from the heart. As we find ourselves in prayer today or the next time you pray, it is suggested and encouraged to notice what feelings are stirring in your heart. And if you can, to express these feelings in your dialogue with Jesus. I love you, Jesus. So that's something we could get used to saying. Perhaps you're more used to praying with your mind than with your heart. Sometimes I am really like this. Nah. Let's get down to business. Nah. I love the way that Father Michael and Father Vic, uh, where we go, very purposefully guided us to understand and reflect on the context, the scenario, et cetera, et cetera, of the gospel text. Nah. And as a doctor, I am trained and expected to follow where hard facts, data, and evidence lead me. So very often, I find my intellect, my brain, you know, really takes over, even in my prayer. Many times, maybe especially for, for doctors, you know, we are blissfully unaware of our emotions. Sometimes after taking care of a very difficult case, uh, or after a baby in our care dies, after all our efforts, I take time to ask my, my students, my doctor students, how, do you, how did you feel after all that? Often they do not have the words to express their emotions. Perhaps we can be like this in prayer, and that's okay. The Spirit is ready to help us listen to and notice how our heart is being moved, or even how we are not being moved. 
Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. But that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. Romans 8, 26. God understands the cries of the heart, even when they are too deep for words. You can find different ways or words express your affection for Jesus. Ask the Spirit to teach you how to pray in all ways. Always. Praying with our feelings is not an end in itself. In our reading today, the people in the synagogue were moved into action by their strong emotions. For one, emotions have a powerful effect on our memory. Many studies have shown the most vivid memories tend to be of emotional events, which are likely to be recalled more often and with more clarity and detail than neutral events. Sometimes our resolve to do an action, to follow Jesus, can be helped by the memory of our feelings in prayer. We can at the very least remember better what we resolve to do. What were your resolutions at the beginning of the year? How are you doing? Bring these resolutions back into prayer one more time with feeling. As we pray today and every day, the invitation is to also pray with our feelings. Express your ardor and great need to our beloved. Notice how the word pierces your heart and what flows out. Is it rage? Is it deep sorrow? Is it indescribable joy? Jesus is ready and able to listen to us and dialogue with us. So a bit of an assignment. So the first reading for this Sunday is Jeremiah 1, 4 to 5. It says, The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I dedicated you. Wow. Does that stir something in your heart? This week, just choose a day. could be today to pray with this passage. Before you get down to this, this, Notice your feelings and talk about them with Jesus. Okay, so let us now turn to our gospel reading. This reading is a continuation of last week's Sunday gospel, which we also prayed about in your Zoe last, uh, last week with Father Vic. Thank you, Father Vic. Um, uh, Father Vic actually now is uh, conducting a retreat for my doctors in Tagaytay. So unfortunately, I am not there. <laughs> no, but Father Vic's taking care of my students. I'm very grateful for Father Vic. Um, and he helped me put our prayer today in the right context. Our context is the same. It's the beginning of the public ministry of Jesus in Galilee. And St. Luke places Jesus in the synagogue of his hometown of Nazareth. No surprise. As a devout Jewish man, Jesus is there on the Sabbath according to his custom. Remember that St. Luke, who is also a doctor, by the way, wrote his gospel primarily for a Gentile, non-Jewish Christian audience. So these words are addressed to us. Now, we're not, we don't have the Jewish culture, but we are God lovers, Theophilus. Welcome back to the Theophilus in us. What is surprising here in this scene is Jesus declaring himself in so many words to be a, the long-awaited Messiah of his people. Jesus lays out an outline of his coming public ministry by reading from the book of Isaiah. Thus, Jesus declares he intends to bring good tidings to the poor to proclaim liberty to captives and recovery of sight to the blind and let the press go free. This reminds me of the recent um, presidential interviews. So, so here we have Jesus, sort of in the same situation, proclaiming clearly who he was and what he was about to do. Now the platform of his public ministry, which was just beginning. Another layer of context is to understand who is Jesus speaking to here. His Jesus is 
are, uh, include the townspeople of Nazareth, his kababayan, people who have known his family and have seen him grow up. On the other hand, these townspeople have also heard the news about Jesus spread throughout the region. Reports of his preaching in the synagogues in different towns and the praises of those who have heard him. So people, these are townspeople who they've known him maybe all his life. But at the same time, they're also hearing these on social media, so many things about Jesus, so many uh, uh, great stories about Jesus, the praises about Jesus. So as we enter into prayer, it may help to keep in mind what we think we know of Jesus and to beg the Holy Spirit for an open mind and heart to what Jesus wants us to know about him today. If we ex were to examine ourselves, are we like the people of Nazareth who have heard reports about Jesus, who have heard news of his preaching? Perhaps we've heard it from the guidelines of Father Michael, Father Vic, from the sharings we hear here at the zoo. Or have you had a real first-hand encounter with Jesus in your own prayer? Sometimes I feel like the people of Nazareth. I had my first real encounter with Jesus and fell in love with him in January 1993. Wow. <laughs> Sometimes I find myself thinking of, oh, I know Jesus, and I know this story and this passage. And perhaps in my prayer, I end up missing the newness that Jesus always brings. In our story today, Jesus is saying something new and surprising to his own people. In our prayer and dialogue with him, Jesus wants to re reveal himself in a new and surprising way. He wants us to have a first-hand, face-to-face, brand-new encounter with him today and every day. So now we enter the scene. Now Jesus has just declared his platform, his plan for his public ministry. So he says, today, the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And I imagine as he lays down the scroll, you can almost hear a pin drop. And the next moment, we discover the reaction of his audience. Amazement and praises. Hallelujah! So all spoke well of him and were amazed at his gracious words that came from his mouth. Perhaps they were influenced a little bit by the news and reports that came to their town before Jesus himself returned home. Surely they were hanging on every word he said with expectation. Sadly, this first impression did not last. In the next breath, what do they ask? Is this not Joseph's son? The townspeople could point to no sin or wrongdoing in Jesus' past. Now, this is Joseph and Mary's son. But they definitely brought up the fact that he was a local boy, as if that disqualified Jesus from being the Messiah. Isn't he the kid of that carpenter who is poor like us, uneducated like us? Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Nazareth was a very small rural town, primarily of poor shepherds and farmers, maybe a growing town, since Joseph was a builder craftsman. So perhaps there was some need for a construction at the time. We do know that Jesus' family was poor, too poor to offer a lamb after Jesus was born, offering birds instead. So where does Jesus get the idea that he's something special? Jesus did not fit their notion of a Messiah. So maybe we can ponder on these things. Does Jesus fit your notion, your notion of a Messiah? Do you need saving or a savior? In our modern times or in your personal life, what expectations do you have for Jesus? 
And we come to the revelation in the next words of Jesus. We see something of the mind of Jesus at this point, even as he is just starting his public ministry. As the people move very quickly from amazement and praises to disbelief and doubt, Jesus' response to their reluctance to believe was to make himself the point of a proverb. Physician, hear yourself. Do hear in your native place, your hometown, the things that we heard you were done in Capernaum. Physician, cure yourself. Ah, ouch. <laughs> so this is us in 2020 after Taal erupted and just when COVID landed on our shores. So we didn't have masks. <laughs> So as, as I mentioned earlier, so I'm a doctor, no? so a, a doctor, a physician, and my specialty is uh, neonatology, which is a branch of pediatrics. So basically, I take care of uh, premature babies or babies born too soon, babies have problems at birth, like severe anomalies of the heart, the lungs, etc. That's my job. So this was Tino when he was two years old, two years old. And at this age, when he was a little after he turned two, he got sick for the very first time in his life, <laughs> in his life, thanks to the superwoman mommy and the breastfeeding. <laughs> and with a little bit of daddy's excellent care, he never, ever, ever got sick during infancy. You know? Never had a fever, never, nothing. <laughs> so we weren't used to him getting sick. Uh, so it was his first fever ever, so two years old, no, 40, 40 plus degrees Celsius. No, and he had no other symptoms. Oh my God. No, if, if, you were, if you were any other patient, I would simply uh, put on my best bedside manner you know, and soothe the parent you know, with my utmost confidence and charm. You know, all their worries gone with just my assurance that all will be okay. You know, followed by... Deft instructions, what to do. Just do this, do this. So 24 hours passed. 24 hours passed. He still has fever. Two days and then three days. <laughs> By that time, the daddy was already the focus of the mama's fury and rage. <laughs> Physician, cure your own. So Santino got better the next day. So on the fourth day, it was just a case of of Roshola, take this hand. Have you ever felt that sense of helplessness and powerlessness when you yourself or a loved one is sick or going through a challenging time? Speaking of challenging times, no, so sorry, this is very like a medical conference. Now, the past few years have left no one in doubt that the COVID-19 pandemic is exerting enormous pressure on our health systems all around the world, bringing to light the suboptimal resilience of even those classified as supposedly high-performing. A lot of evils, systemic evils, have been unmasked by the pandemic. Long-standing disparities in income, housing, air quality, pre-existing health status, legal protections, and most of all, access to health care. Here in, in our country, we have approached again and again a breaking point in our healthcare systems. In the past two weeks, we were talking about it. I was seeing whole families, you know, kids, parents, and grandparents. You, you all know of somebody who got sick the past two weeks. Now, last week in my NICU, in my unit, our staff was down by 55%. And our patient load was three times our capacity, you know, over 100 babies, most of whom were born to moms with COVID. Physician, cure your world. Where do we even begin to fix this? How do we heal our broken world? Notice that it was Jesus who placed himself in the proverb. Physician, cure yourself. Jesus accepts that he is the physician and discerns that the Nazarenes are demanding that he heal himself. Three things 
to me, we're very clear to Jesus. One, they don't believe he is the Messiah. His beautiful proclamation from the Isaiah, which normally garners praises and amens, is neither heard nor listened to. Two, they want proof. The attitude of the synagogue goers is that a real doctor should be able to prove his credentials by correctly diagnosing and treating whatever ailment he suffers from personally. It'll take more than words to convince us, Jesus. If you're truly the Messiah, prove it by working a miracle or doing something else equally messianic. As Jesus expounds on the proverb, he mentions the miracles he had done in nearby Capernaum, miracles that the Nazarenes had heard about and wanted to see duplicated in their own city. And three, they demand that the miracle worker work some of his miracles at home. The doctor in the proverb should heal himself, that is, he should practice his medicine at home. In the same way, Jesus should display his power at home in Nazareth and not just in other places. In this way, the proverb, physician, heal thyself, is similar to our modern proverb of charity begins at home. How often do I come to prayer with this same attitude of the Nazarenes? Do my actions reflect that I truly hear, listen, and believe in the words of Jesus? Am I growing in faith or am I still looking for proof that Jesus has saved me? Do I demand, do I make demands that Jesus give me this desire or that impossible thing or that miracle before I choose to follow him? The challenge to Jesus was clear. The people of Jesus' hometown demanded signs and wonders before they would accept him as the Messiah. Jesus gave them no miracles. Rather, he used the examples of Elijah and Elisha to show how unbelief in Israel had caused those prophets to work away from home with Gentiles, as we read in verses 25 to 27. Or you can check out their stories sometime this week. First Kings, Second Kings. So the Sabbath crowd listening to Jesus grew angry at that comparison, and they attempted to kill Jesus. So much for a homecoming party for Jesus. Jesus should have been given the keys, the city of Nazareth, Instead, he was given skepticism, rejection, and a terse proverb. Physician, cure yourself. As Jesus told the crowd just before their attempted murder, no prophet is accepted in his home. What struck me the most in my prayer was that Jesus, St. Luke's put Jesus this early in his public ministry, already knew that he would experience rejection by his own people and not just here in his hometown of Nazareth, but in the end, by God's own chosen people, the people beloved of his father. Yet, still he preached. His purpose and mission was clear. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring glad tidings to you, you who are poor and do not accept the true wealth that Jesus offers, you who are captives and do not realize the true freedom of following him, you who are blind and do not see a future full of hope, you who are oppressed and do not realize your citizens of God's kingdom, and members of God's family. Who is this God who chooses to embrace this kind of helplessness and powerlessness? How foolish in the eyes of the world to keep preaching and ministering and know that you will not be believed and even rejected and persecuted. And we are reminded of a similar statement thrown at Jesus. This time, at the end of his ministry, 
we can ponder on Jesus, the wounded healer, dying on the cross, giving his last sermon. And one of the criminals who was hanging there kept deri deriding him, ridiculing him, and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. Oh, my Jesus, what did you feel when you heard that echo of physician, cure yourself? If you are the Messiah, save yourself. Another invitation, perhaps, to ponder and pray, and perhaps notice and express your feelings as we ask these questions. Why did God come in the form of a baby, totally dependent and helpless? Why did Jesus allow himself to be crucified totally helpless and powerless? And why does Jesus give himself to us today in the form of a thin, broken piece of bread in the eyes of this world, totally powerless and useless? And maybe... We can draw further insight in the experience of Jaime, our founder, before the Blessed Sacrament. As he pondered in dialogue before the tabernacle, gazing on the helplessness of Jesus in the consecrated bread. No feet, no mouth, no tongue, no head, no mind. Then Jesus questioned, Jaime asked Jesus, would you like Jesus to go here, there, to the cities, and to the world? And Jesus answered, I would love to. And so we pray for the grace to echo Jaime's response. My feet are yours, Jesus. You will go, Jesus, to the cities and to the world because my life is yours. You will go. And we ask our dear Mother Mary to help us open our hearts, our minds, our deepest desires to the Lord in our time of prayer. Amen. Okay, so thank you. And for those who are uh, staying for the prayer time, or you can take us home. If you need to leave, here are our reflection questions. Um, number one, God cares deeply about what we, his children, are experiencing in our hearts. In your dialogue with Jesus, your thoughts, feelings, and desires can form the very substance of your prayer. What feelings did you notice in your prayer today? Number two, in your personal experience in these modern times, what does it mean to need a Messiah? Does Jesus fit your notion of a savior? What expectations, expectations do you have for Jesus? And last, in what area of your life do you feel powerless or helpless? As we ponder on the wounded and defeated body of Christ, can you draw strength and hope? So let's now break um, for 30 minutes, I think, of prayer time. Thank you. Oops. Another another son of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, dear Lord, we thank you for the team that graciously led us up close to you today. For uh, Dr. Resty, for our readers, Ruel, our organizing team, Emmy, Yvonne, Reverend Jojo, soon to be Father Jojo, um, Johnny, our technical support. And the presence of God, our Blessed Mother, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. We thank you for having us again experience your love and care, the blessings you accord us. We are so grateful. May we enjoy many more loving dialogues and enriching encounters with you. For you are the source, Lord, of our joy, our strength, our hope. All this we ask in Jesus' name and always with the intercession of our Blessed Mother.
Amen. 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 What a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.